Hello, 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 and welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, episode number 122. My name is Mindy Jensen, and with me as always is my getting ready for a reset co-host, Scott Trench. Oh, wait, that sounds bad. That sounds like you're getting like resetting something big. But you know, finances are big, so I'll stick with that. Welcome, Scott. Yeah, how's it going, Mindy? I'm having a great day. How are you doing? I am doing fantastic. Excited to talk about money and get back to, I think, kind of that more longer term focus here. So, you know, we've talked a lot about coronavirus recently. We'll talk a little bit about it today, but it's uh, it's time to get back on track for the long term things that work in any environment. I couldn't say it better, so I won't. Scott and I are here to make financial independence less scary, less just for somebody else, and show you that by following the proven path, you can put yourself on the road to early financial freedom and get money out of the way so you can lead your best life. That's right. Whether you want to retire early and travel the world, go on to make big time investments in assets like real estate or start your own business or take a moment to reset your finance, your finances, we'll help you build a position capable of launching yourself towards those dreams. Okay, today's episode does not feature any guest, but is instead just Scott and I talking. In recent weeks, we have tried to allay your financial worries. The stock market dropped uh, rather rapidly in March, so we brought in the master, J.L. Collins, to talk about the history of the market and his opinion of its viability. Uh, Spoiler alert, he's pretty pro-stock market even after all of these drops. Yes, and in episode number 118, we brought in a certified financial planner to share some smart money moves to try to take advantage of market conditions. Kyle Mast from uh, episode 41 originally and episode 84 the second time came back in episode 118 for the third time and had a bunch of great ideas about like the Roth IRA uh, contribution ladder and those types of things in particular. So a really good episode there if you haven't checked it out yet. Yes, I took the information that I learned from that episode and I applied that. I haven't actually uh, uh, contributed to my Roth IRA in a long time, but because the filing deadline has been moved to July 15th, I think, the tax filing deadline, your contribution deadline has been moved as well. So I was able to contribute to my 2019 Roth IRA and will soon contribute to my 2020 Roth IRA as well. Um, We also wanted to check in and see how early retirees are handling this new normal. Uh, And we brought in an all-star cast for episode 119, The Mad Fientist, uh, Millennial Revolution, Go With Less, Marriage, Kids, and Money, and a future guest, Doug Nordman from The Military Guide. They all joined us to share how the market downturn has affected their early retirement lifestyle and plans. Yep, and then, um, you know, the second to most recent episode here was one where we talked to Michael Kitzes, and uh, he's a CFP like Kyle Mass, but he's done a lot of extensive original research on the 4% rule, back testing uh, portfolios against the historical worst case market conditions in the last 140 years, and just an, a phenomenal data nerd that I just thoroughly enjoyed uh, watching. You just, just Push the play button on that episode and watch this guy go to town, destroying every mathematical and logical argument that a naysayer for the fire movement might have. <laughs> it was <laughs> phenomenal. And I really enjoyed watching your face as yeah. you said that he's a data nerd. You're a bit of a data geek yourself, Scott. And just uh, watching him say these things and Scott's like, yes, 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 yes. It's like, I cannot agree more. And you know, you said mathematics behind this, you can't really argue with, not can't really, you can't argue with Michael Kitsis because he uses math and math doesn't lie. Two plus two is always four. It's never not four. So he shows you the mathematical reasons behind why this works. And what did, what did he do in that, that uh, screenshot? He had what a hundred cases of 30 years worth of data. And in one instance in year 31, you went below zero. It's just a what? phenomenal way to go about it. It's a really good application of statistics, back testing, market research, portfolio uh, analysis, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, you know, the conclusion is the basic tenets of this thing we call the FIRE movement, financial, financial independence, retire early, they hold true unless you're planning for something that is far worse than anything ever produced in, in modern history. So you can always make that argument that this time it's going to be far worse than anything ever, anything else. But, you know, we'd all argue that uh, I think if you plan for that, you're really going to be 
going so far that you're going to sacrifice many more years of your life than is necessary to, uh, to build out such a ridiculously conservative position. And you know, that's interesting that you say that towards the end of the episode, Michael gives you permission to, if you're at a job that you hate and you're not quite at your fire number yet, reevaluate your numbers and maybe change up your life, quit the job that you hate so that you can continue, you know, maybe take a pay cut, maybe, and of course he says it so much more eloquently than I do, but take a pay cut and go find a job that brings you happiness while you're continuing to pursue your financial independence. And I got a text from a friend who said, I think this this episode was meant directly to me. That spoke to me so much. I am going to quit as soon as I can go back to work from coronavirus. So there you go. Well done, Michael. And then last week we spoke with a mortgage broker, Seth Jones, about lending requirements and refinancing your loan. Should you wait or should you do it now? Uh, we even discussed mortgage forbearance and should you use mortgage forbearance if you don't need it. And just in case you didn't listen to that episode, which you should because it's a great one, no, you should not use mortgage forbearance unless you absolutely need it because it can affect your credit. Uh, okay, so this week we're getting back to financial independence basics, kind of a reset, if you will. We've been locked down for about four weeks now, and my spending has changed dramatically. I mean, first of all, you can't go anywhere or do anything because everything's closed. Um, but I've cut my travel budget by 100%. And unlike many fire adherents, I don't miss it at all. Um, it turns out I really like having a steady routine and being at home and, you know, just kind of hanging out and relaxing. It seems to me that travel is very like go, go, go all the time. I don't know. Maybe that's my travel partner. Have you ever seen Carl? He can't sit still. Yeah. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, I traveled, I made probably 20 trips in 2019. Um, uh, that involved air travel and probably 11 or 12 of those were bigger pockets or work related, which are also fun. I just love my job and <laughs> love, love those types of travel. And then probably seven or eight of them were, were, uh, mostly personal reasons. So certainly missing a little bit of that travel. We actually had a, a trip scheduled for a week or two ago. We're going to go to Grand Cayman and going to go scuba diving for the first time. And so we're certainly missing oh. that trip. And, um, Certainly, you know, we were supposed to have a wedding in July where one of my good friends is, is getting married and I'm going to be in that wedding. And that was postponed until November. So we, we are certainly missing the travel, uh, but also obviously not spending the money associated with that travel. Yeah, I am supposed to be going to Las Vegas this weekend for my in-laws 50th wedding anniversary. Happy anniversary, Michelle and Bill. Um, so there, there has been some travel that's been disrupted. That would have been a good trip to go to. That would have been a nice, fun time. It's always fun to see family. But yeah, in 2019, I think I traveled every month and it was just a lot for me. So that part I'm not missing so much. Um, and I don't know, well, I know you're not married to somebody who obsessively watches your monthly spending because you're not married yet, but I am married to somebody who obsessively watches our monthly spending and he, we talk about it all the time. And it's, it's actually kind of funny. Like every morning we only spent this much this week. I'm like, okay, great. Like whatever. <laughs> but then he tells me that last, I don't like keep track of it. Oh, okay, great. In one ear and out the other. And he tells me that last year on average, we spent $5,000 a month, which is $60,000 a year. And back to that 4% rule, my 4% rule numbers are based on spending $40,000 a year or even more like $36,000 a year with a little bit of a cushion. And $60,000 a year a year for those of you who are not math nerds is slightly more than $36,000. Um, almost double. So I track my spending. I talk about money on this show. I talk about money all day, every day anyway. And I still allowed lifestyle creep to creep up on me. And I was actually really shocked when he told me that, when he told me that, you know, and, and now we're on track to save, I'm sorry, to spend $2,500 this month. That's like, we cut our spending in half just by not being able to buy anything at all. And I don't feel like I'm not able to buy anything at all. I mean, I don't miss, I don't go shopping. I don't miss like doing that kind of thing, but lifestyle creep is real. And it happens if you're not paying attention. It happens if you're paying attention. 
Um, I track my spending. I have not one, but two apps on my phone for spending tracking, uh, courtesy of the Waffles on Wednesday spending tracker, where you can uh, you can make your own mobile spending tracker using their instructions. Uh, we will link to that in the show notes, which can be found today at biggerpockets.com slash money show one, two, two. But Scott, let's get back to the financial independence basics. What are the core tenets of financial independence? Spend less than you earn, invest aggressively, increase your active earned income or create assets. Okay. And you forgot the fifth one, live the life that you truly love now that money is no longer a consideration. Ah, I like that addition. Yes. I like that ad- that addition too. So how do you spend less than you earn? You track your spending because mm-hmm. when you don't know where your money is going, you will find that it goes so easily. I mean, it's just a dollar. It's just $10. Oh, I'll buy dinner for everybody. Oh, I'll just do this. And then all of a sudden you're like, where did my paycheck go? I got it five minutes ago and it's gone. Scott, I'm going to put you on the spot. How do you save money? Do you pay yourself first? Do you get your paycheck, pay all your bills, and then bank what's left over? Do you have a system in place? Or are you just kind of willy-nilly? Um, well, when I started out on the journey, the first thing I did was I mapped out, I tracked my spending. I use Mint. Dot com. So all of my spending goes through mint.com. It goes either through one of my bank accounts hooked up with mint or through a, um, a credit card. My credit cards being linked up with mint. Um, in the rare instances where I use cash, for example, I might prepay my gym membership at a local gym with cash um, to get a, a, a discount and not have to pay credit. That, that I will categorize if it's a large expense manually. And then I might spend three or $400 a year in petty cash um, outside of that, which I just kind of lump into my entertainment budget and don't track specifically. So that allows me to really automatically track every single dollar that I spend. Um, and then when I started out, I really looked at the, the, the big categories. What are, where is my money going? And those categories were really housing and transportation and food at first. Um, and over time, I was able to really, I was able to basically eliminate my housing expense. So there's, there's a couple ways I can look at my housing expense because I, because I house hack, I pay money to a business that I own to occupy space in a property that I own. So I consider it, you know, you can look at it as here's the amount of rent I would pay if I was a tenant here, which is about 800 bucks a month, or it's free. <laughs> so so that, that, that I looked at it, okay, that's my biggest expense. How do I make that an economic neutral or even a wealth building facility rather than a loss in rent? So I, that's, I started out with house hacking, right? The second biggest expense was my transportation expense, which was mostly my car payment on my Corolla and associated gas mileage, those types of things. I spend very, I don't, I, I have a very short commute when I do drive. Uh, and so I spent about $2,000 all in last year uh, related to my car payments. So $800 a month for housing, 200 bucks a month for for the car. Now, here's the really big embarrassing one now that I'm looking at it for 2019 <laughs> is my my food budget. I spent I spent about 20 grand on food. Half about about half of which was on groceries and half of which was on dining out and delivery, <laughs> which is not the best use of money, but because I live, because I have almost no expense for my housing and transportation, I'm able to get away with overall, all in, about a net annual spend of about thirty thousand dollars for my uh, for uh, my for my personal spending there. Now, I will caveat that as well and say that I'm excluding a couple of things here for those listening. One, I'm excluding anything related to getting engaged or getting married, which is a big expense um, because it's not my lifestyle expense; it's a one-time situation. And I'm also excluding my taxes, my taxes, which I think most people just exclude, but I have to pay taxes out of pocket for certain parts of my income. And I'm excluding any expenses related to running businesses that as I designate as separate from my, my lifestyle. Okay. That's fair. I exclude, like I said before, I have two spending trackers on my phone. One is for regular old spending and one is for expenses for the house because we did just buy a new house that needs a lot of work. So every time I go to Home Depot and drop $2,000, I don't think it's fair to count that against my regular lifestyle spending. That is housing expenses. And I think we've spent something like $30,000 on 
the house right now. I bought windows and, you know, lots of other things. But yeah, that doesn't count because that's not a, re- a uh, recurring cost. Um, but groceries are, you know, there's this uh, little podcast called Bigger Pockets Money. And if you listen to episode three, you can hear Aaron Chase talk about how to cut your grocery bill in half scott trench who <laughs> needs to do you remember recording that that was the best show ever because you're just sitting there like oh my goodness i could cut my spending you know what you know what though like <laughs> look i cut my housing and transportation expense i love how me and my fiance eat i love taking her out to dinner once a week when, when you know at least once a week when the when the stores are open we like to go out to breakfast uh many fridays prior to work hours that's like a little tradition we have uh, and a little tip there for a fairly frugal but wonderful date you can have um, for those t- for that type of stuff. And she likes to make delicious food. And so I'm not willing to continue cutting back more on the grocery and food budget right now because I'm happy with with that level of spend. And I'm I'm frugal enough in other areas. And of course, I have some some passive income to do it. But I do track it. I track every dollar. Well, I'm glad that you track every dollar. Uh, Mm -hmm. Maybe you could start a little blog called French Toast on Fridays. Yeah, (laughs) there you go. (laughs) But no, if you are looking for ways to cut your uh, $20,000 a year grocery bill, Aaron Chase's episode has a lot of really great tips. Yeah, and I would say say that the big big contributor there is going to be the the restaurants and dining out. Yes, and you know, right now I'm not going out to eat at all. We are still locked down in... Uh, for from the coronavirus, and I, there are restaurants that are doing takeout, but I don't know how comfortable I feel. Well, I know how comfortable I feel with that, zero percent comfortable. So I'm not doing any takeout right now. And when we do get the lockdown lifted, I will be going out to dinner more, um, just because I want to support the local economy and support the local restaurants that are supporting, you know, the local waitresses and you know all the people that are currently not working. So I do have plans to go out and I do expect my uh, spending the next month to be quite high. Um, but it, it'll be Scott Trench like. There you go. <laughs> my, uh, my, uh, I will, I will say in light of the coronavirus uh, stuff, my spending has dropped considerably on like regular life situations. But because because we're, we're at home all the time, I've really, you know, you can call it investment. I've spent uh, a lot of money on, on things like I bought a pull-up structure that's like pretty sturdy. So I can, I can work at, and a, a, some weights and a subscription to an online workout studio, Beachbody, so that I can work out in my garage on a regular basis. I'm buying a bookshelf and some furniture as we decided, hey, we're going to be in this place for a while. Let's clean it out <laughs> and really reorganize <laughs> it and make it more conducive to lifestyle. So I, I've spent a couple hundred bucks on things related to that. And then, of course, you know, we, we've stocked up considerably on household goods um, because of all the uncertainty and all that kind of stuff, just like everybody else in the, the worst of American consumerism, but you know, like, Hey, we didn't have a pantry before. It's like, okay, now's a good time to get a pantry. Going. <laughs> yeah. So, so, okay. So here's a question. You are setting up a home gym. Are you going to continue with your gym membership after the ban has lifted? And that's a great question. So I told you I prepaid my annual, my membership annually because I get a deal there. And that, yes. I think that was the right bet. You know, I you can't, you know, play it around your coronavirus. So I will have the, the gym membership and the home workout equipment. But because I don't have a line of sight into uh, this ending, I'm not going to go weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and months and months without being able to work out with weights and in a way that is, you know, fairly efficient. So that's just very important to me. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, um, that's a good point. I do see people, I had just renewed my membership, um, I believe March 8th, right in time for the whole thing to be shut down. Um, but I do enjoy going to the gym. Well, I don't enjoy, enjoy it. I go to the gym and I take the classes there. Um, if you've ever met me, you know, I hate working out. So, but I do find value in it and I will continue to have the gym membership. Um, but there are things that I don't find value in and I'm, you know, I'm going to step back from there. We're doing a lot of different things with cooking. These weird food shortages have shown me that there are different ways to cook. You don't have to have, um, you know, you don't have to go and grab ingredients from the grocery store. You can just find something in your pantry. 
we had a thing in our Facebook group. Um, if you're a member of our Facebook group, you may have seen this. Chef Chris Clark from Something About Food podcast did this super fun show me your pantry thing where she, you take a picture of your cupboards and you show it to her and she picks things, she picks ingredients and, oh, you can take this and mix it with that and mix it with this and have a great meal. And you're like, oh my goodness, that's amazing. Um, so I've been sharing pictures with her. I've been, you know, kind of trying to clear out the pantry. Um, but it's also shown me different ways to shop. I'm going to Costco and buying, you know, the 20 pound bag of onions. And I share that with my neighbor. We have one other person that we've been isolating with that, um, you know, so I'm saving money. I'm cooking better. I'm, yeah, I have time to make these three hour dinners. And it's, it's really nice to see that that's something that I do find value in. I'm going to continue doing that. Yeah. I love it. We're, 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 you we Virginia would would be appalled if if I said we are cooking. Virginia uh, is making a lot of a lot of meal. We're, we're basically eating all of our meals at home, and they're all extremely affordable. And that allows us to go and and try a couple of new recipes and things with better quality ingredients in some cases. So we'll get um, some high quality meats and those types of things and make them at home and all that all that kind of good stuff but yeah i mean there's nothing there's nothing else like you can't you can only order uber eats so many times and you know <laughs> that that's more expensive than anything else so you know so you go to the grocery store and and you know now you have to do what we've been talking about all along which is make most of your meals most of the time at home with reasonable groceries for reasonable grocery stores it's just the only option <laughs> that most people have in a, in a reasonable sense in light of the coronavirus situation Okay, Scott, two of the best real-life examples of increasing your income were told on our shows not that long ago. Financial Mechanic came on as a guest on episode 97, and she shared her story of knowing your worth, asking for a raise, negotiating salary, and how salary isn't the only thing that you can negotiate. Yeah, I thought it was a, a, a fantastic episode, and, you know, I think temporarily what we're seeing here is we're seeing lots of layoffs. We're seeing lots of people unemployed. We're seeing lots of businesses appearing to struggle um, right away. And it's very difficult for me to sit here and think, hey, are all these are all these businesses really running so lean and so tight that with one month into this thing or within weeks into this thing, they had to lay off 20 million people? That's just that's just a crazy assumption for me. It doesn't doesn't make any sense how you could be keeping it that close to the chest at all times in one of the best economies. But you know, any from there, you know, what you have to realize, I think, is we are likely in a deflationary period for wages in the short term. I think. Right. I think that there's overall you're going to see incomes in this country decline or at least wage income in total decline over the next couple of weeks and months. So I think that that turns out if you're laid off or if you're in the job market looking, I think your prospects of getting a raise have just declined significantly. I think your prospects of keeping your job have declined significantly. And I think your prospects for other types of work have declined significantly. So I think that leaves, how do I become very creative about this and have those multiple different income streams, right? Like landlords are not expecting the same amount of rent on average (laughs) that they were getting a few months ago, right? We're all expecting, we're all at least aware of the possibility that, you know, I got hundred percent of rents in April. In April. In April. Am I going to get that in May? Am I going to get that in June? Right? So I expect generally speaking across my various income streams for a, a decline in income, over the next coming weeks, you know, whether that's from a decline in dividends, whether that's a decline in the rents that I'm going to receive, whether that's a decline in interest rates, I'll get on cash in the bank, right? Uh, I do happen to be the CEO of Bigger Pockets, so I kind of can understand what my my salary probably won't be changing there. Um, <laughs> you know, I think we're in relatively reasonable shape as a business at Bigger Pockets, so I don't think there's going to be any problems there for for me or the, the team there. But but that's that's I think the mentality we have to understand with that. So in, in that context, how do I go about increasing my income right now? Well, it's the same thing you would do in any other economy, but just with that caveat, right? I know that I'm going to have a little harder time getting that side hustle income or a little more competition if I'm going to drive for Uber or a little more competition if I'm going to try to do something online, an online 
gig or, or freelance work, right? And I'm going to have to accept a little lower wages. But that's all in the context of the discussion we just had previously, where I'm probably spending a lot less than my run rate is in normal times. So how's that for a framework to think about that? I think that's a great framework to think about. But I also want to say that there are still businesses that are hiring right now. Mm-hmm. You know, Amazon uh, is is having a little bit of a bump in sales. I don't know if you've been spending a lot of time on Amazon. I get way too many Amazon packages right now. Um, but they are hiring pickers. Is it a glamorous job? No, but it's a job. Mm-hmm. It puts, I mean, there are people who are getting their hours cut. If you have, I mean, does anybody have time right now? Everybody has time. There's nothing open. You can't do anything. So if you can't do something, generate income in a different way. And that's really easy for me to sit here and say that. And I recognize that. And, but there are still opportunities out there to generate income. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting because there's the, the, the economy is just all slowing down right now, it seems like. And, you know, I have this suspicion that a lot of people are just at home and they're not being as productive as they are in normal times. Right, that it's it's hey, I'm I'm at home, and I'm either working from home or I'm maybe laid off or something like that. And how do I occupy that time? And am I doing that productively? What are, what are productive uses of time? Is it listening to podcasts, those types? You know, we've seen we have a lot of in, in, in insider information, obviously with Bigger Pockets, we track our our business performance very closely. We've seen a decrease in listenership to podcasts. We've seen a decrease in audiobook sales recently. You know, you wonder why that happened. Well, it's because people are not commuting anymore. They're not going to the gym. So they're not listening to these types of things. By the way, thank you, Bigger Pockets Money listeners. We actually have not seen a change in listenership. If anything, we've seen a, a actual some growth in recent weeks. So we know that's because you love my jokes, but we appreciate your, your loyalty <laughs> as listeners. Um, but, but, you know, we're, you're seeing these things industry-wide, um, which leads me to, to wonder out loud if – the fact that people are stuck at home and there's a recession looming means that people are just kind of settling into unproductive habits generally. And you just, you know, something to wonder about yourself, you know, can you come out of this with part-time work that's reasonable and safe, even if it doesn't pay what it, the rate it was paying six, seven, eight weeks ago, right? Can you come out of this with a new skill? Can you come out of this with 10, you know, more knowledge, 10 books that you've read, that are productive towards your long-term goals, those types of things. Can you map out your goals for the first time ever here? And so I think these, I think those are the ways to think about looking at this from the context of income generation. I think that's a really great point, Scott, just because you can't go out or you may not be able to go out and instantly generate income. Doesn't mean you can't start studying and collecting knowledge and teaching yourself new skills. And like you said, doing the things that will eventually pay off. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I got nothing but time. There you go. Lots and lots of free time. Okay. Invest in low cost quality investment vehicles. Scott, what is a low cost quality investment vehicle? You know, I think, I think in this context, so so this is the third pillar of, of, uh, financial freedom, right? And the, the third pillar is invest in assets that appreciate in cash flow, right? And so the best way to do that, I think, is to go invest in what we mean by low cost is index funds or funds that do not require high management fees, right? So for example, if I go out and buy Berkshire Hathaway stock, right? I'm not incurring a management fee. I'm incurring the fees of the, the, the CEOs and management and shareholders and employees and all that kind of stuff for investing for a portion of the proceeds, the market capitalization company. But I'm not paying a money manager to pick that stock for me. When I invest in a mutual fund, right, oftentimes those come with a manager who is picking those stocks and taking a performance fee on top of the fees of management for all those companies that they're investing in. And so that's what we mean by that is, is we... we is a, is a group here on Bigger Pockets Money like to invest in index funds that have the lowest possible overhead fees to give us the broadest possible diversification across as many businesses as possible. So, you know, J.L. Collins, I think, is really the thought leader on this subject in his book, The Simple Path to Wealth. We had him on what episode? 116? 116. 
116. Yeah, very recently. And he likes the, an, an index fund called VTSAX, right? We're, we're able to brave it for that. But it's, it's basically you're investing in the 5,000 largest companies in the world. Uh, and you're investing in them pro rata based on their market capitalization. So similarly, I like the S&P 500, which is uh, a, another index fund called VOO, simply because it's got larger companies in it and it's simpler for me to understand. But they're, you know, six to one, half a dozen of the other type situation where it doesn't really matter. Just look for index funds that have very low fees and invest for the very, very, very long term. It's kind of the philosophy that we, we stick with. Yep. Vanguard has been thrown about, but I do want to throw out uh, Fidelity as well. They have, you know, obviously their fund is going to be named something different, but it's the same basic idea. Yeah. And, and which, which index funds you invest in may also be a function of the retirement account vehicles that your employer offers. So, you know, for example, we don't have at Bigger Pockets a, a Fidelity or Vanguard option because it's impractical for us to have that in our retirement planning. So we have a, an index fund called the Great West 500 Fund, and that is the lowest fee index fund in um, our retirement vehicle set. So that's what I invest in through my, my 401k, not because you know if, if I had a lower cost index fund, I'd invest with that. And my husband is very tech savvy and tech, like uh, all he does is read tech news all day long. Mm-hmm. Um, so we invest in the Vanguard tech ETF called VGT. Nice. But again, it's, you know, it covers the, the tech industry. It just, there's, there's an index fund for everything. Find mm-hmm. one that you think sounds interesting and go with that and VTSAX. There you go. Okay. Number four, create multiple passive streams of income. And this is slightly different from the investing in low cost quality investment vehicle, Scott. Uh, this one includes real estate, something near and dear to our hearts and starting a business. Or writing a book. Or writing a book. But, you know, I I really like real estate. I mean, I love real estate. If you've heard me talk for a minute, you know that I love real estate. I have been involved in real estate investing for 20 something years. And I just want to put out an idea, just, you know, a thought for you. There was a triplex around the corner from my old house. And it is, we live in a fairly, it, would you say Denver is a high cost of living or a medium cost of living area. Oh, Denver is, I think Denver is certainly in the higher end cost of living. It's not New York or San Francisco or Los Angeles, but certainly one of the top 10 metro areas in terms of expense, I bet, in this country. Okay. So a higher cost of living area. This property was on the market for $500,000. I had an offer out for $450,000. We were going back and forth. They were about to accept it. And I kind of pulled back because I was getting a little scared. Frankly, one of the tenants there was frightening to me. um, And I was not looking forward to kicking them out. I was going to (laughs) have... I was going to hire a couple of really big guys to come with you me. You know, too. Mindy, no, no one sells a house that's in perfect condition with wonderful on-time tenants who are perfectly well-behaved in a great location for a big discount. So, I know. I not know. Not a real estate investor. Of it. <laughs> and he had just put this guy in there. I'm like, you didn't screen him at all. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, even being involved in, in bigger pockets and all of these things, it was kind of frightening to me, but the numbers were amazing. And I was having breakfast with Darren Sager and he's like, why would you not make an offer on it? So it was, it's 450 would have been the purchase price. Under market rents for all three tenants were coming in at $38,000 a year. Now that's not the 1% rule, which is you're renting out for 1% of the purchase price per month. But it was really close and it was under market. And I really believed that ten or twenty thousand dollars worth of rehab costs on this property would have increased it such that I could be getting one percent. That covers what I thought I was spending every year. Um, you know, thirty eight, forty, forty five thousand dollars a year is I mean, four hundred and fifty thousand dollars would have covered me for my whole spending for the year. Whereas to generate $40,000 with the 4% rule, I would have needed a million dollars. Yeah. You know, I think when, when you think about the 4% rule, right, you're, you're, it's, it's interesting because the 4% rule involves, hey, I've got a stock, stock and bond portfolio. I'm going to spend the interest that's generated by my bond portfolio and the um, dividends generated by my stock portfolio. And then I'm going to sell off a tiny fraction of both my bond and stock portfolio. 
right? I'm going to rebalance every year. That, that's a, those are fundamental assumptions for the 4% rule. So when you think about a real estate investor, a real estate investor will typically consider themselves retired only when they have ret- when they're able to spend less than their total cash flow produced by their portfolio. So that'd be the equivalent of a stock investor only spending so, uh, most of the dividends and not selling anything off. So I, I actually think that a, a real estate retiree living off a minority, not a minority, but but less than the total amount of cash flow produced by their business after accounting for expenses like CapEx, expected long-term vacancies, those types of things. That person, I think, is actually living in a really, really conservative um, financial position from a retired standpoint, to your point. So we're, we're in the context of this fourth wealth builder, right? In, investing in appreciable or creating assets, right? We have investing in assets and creating assets. Real estate's kind of a hybrid because you're not creating an asset and you're not starting a business, but you're kind of doing a hybrid, right? You have to run the business of real estate, but it is much more passive than many other types of businesses that you could go and start, right? Now, if you're thinking about investing in real estate in the context of Corona, go back and listen to episode 121, with Seth Jones, where we go into great detail about mortgages, right? You want to, you know, buying real estate typically involves using leverage and getting a loan right now, you're going to want to have your tax documents in a row. You want to make sure that there weren't any major disruptions to your income or that if there were, you're still able to qualify for financing on the types of properties you'd like to buy, right? Have a strong cash position and analyze for the fundamentals. But we are seeing in many markets, a lightening of competition, you know, properties are sitting on the market for a little bit longer. Properties are, you know, asking price seems to be reducing a little bit. Rents also seem to, asking rents at least, a lead indicator for rents long-term seem to be declining a little bit. So we're starting to see a little bit of softening there. So it could be a good opportunity to get in the market, but then you're timing the market. So, you know, it really comes around to that long-term strategy and understanding what you need to do while also taking practical considerations like the financing stuff we talked about last week uh, into consideration when you're going in to make your first buy, your purchase here. But you can, again, be using all of this extra time that you have to be educating yourself. If you haven't been paying attention to the real estate market in your area, now is the time to start looking at what properties are being listed for, what they're selling for, how long they're sitting on the market. Because once you start seeing these things and you get kind of a feel for what's going on, you can spot a deal. It doesn't need to sit on the market for 50 days for you to know that it's a good deal. For it, 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 Just because it's sitting on the market for 50 days doesn't mean it's a good deal. Um, I reached out to some investors in the uh, resort areas near near us because I think there's going to be some deals out there. I need to start learning that market again and see what's what's going on so I can take advantage when there is something. Um, but like you said just a moment ago, there's less competition. I think that as people are not prepared financially for coronavirus and you know this wasn't something that you put in your little budget sheet – you know, oh, make sure I have a line item for coronavirus every month just in case it happens. But there are people who got caught with their pants down and they might have to. We, we do have a line item in our underwriting for that, though. It's called reserves and it's called conservative assumptions around vacancy and CapEx, right? So, yes. like, absolutely. There's a whole point. One of the whole points of this money show, right? Why does Bigger Pockets have a money podcast? Well, one, Mindy and I love talking about money, right? But this was, we got to do this show before they they gave me the big t- the big job here at Bigger Pockets. We, we do this show because when you want to invest in real estate, you need to do it from a position of financial strength. You got to cover the basics, spend less than you earn, accumulate capital, have good credit, put yourself in position to make a meaningful investment. How do you get started with real estate investing with a thousand bucks and ruin credit? You don't, in our opinion, Right, Mindy? Yes. Yes. Right? You, you fix your credit problem and you fix your 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 income problem. And you do that over a long period of time and you invest from position to strength where each investment accelerates your position towards your goal, but you don't depend on any of them. Right? Yes. But not all of the investors that are out there right now have followed Scott and my advice. So There may be opportunities out there. There may be opportunities simply because other people aren't buying and you would like to buy. You have the ability to buy. There may be opportunities when somebody made a foolish choice, didn't buy from a position of strength, and now needs to liquidate their holdings so they don't lose everything. We call these people motivated sellers, and they're how you get a great real estate investment deal in lots of cases. 
So yes. a little bit of dark humor there. Now, <laughs> moving on to the other side of this, right? So we have real estate, we have business, right? I highly, highly suggest if you're interested in getting into a, a uh, business or starting a business or owning a business or buying a business or any type of thing related to that, go and listen to the Bigger Pockets business podcast hosted by Jay and Carol Scott and start with business episode 51 right? Let, let me talk about this for a minute because this episode came out recently. I actually think one of my favorite episodes of the BP Money Show ever might have been the one with Michael Kitz's episode 120, right? One of my favorite podcasts ever might also be Biz Bigger Pockets Business 51, which came out the same week. It was just a great week of podcasts <laughs> uh, for, for, my, for my personal enjoyment, at least. Now, this guy, they interviewed a guy named Nigel, who I can't pronounce his last name, Right. So Nigel bought a, 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 I'll let you listen to the episode, but basically 320,000 businesses in this country are being shut down or sold by baby boomers who own them every year. Right. A staggering number. And many of those businesses are not sold. They're shut down. These are, these are businesses. If you go on places like buy, biz, sell, and look in your local market, you'll see unsexy, boring, but established 20, 30 year businesses selling for two or three or four times cash flow. For a real estate investor, that's considered what, like a, a 20, 20, a 25, 33 or 50% cash on cash ROI, right? These are businesses that, that the, the consideration for these folks isn't how do I get top dollar for selling my business? You can, you can get seller carry notes on them. You can finance them with small business loans with 10, 20% down, right? There's lots of financing options for this. There's lots of cash flow, and there's lots of businesses that just can't get sold because there's no buyers, even with those price points. Um, and, and sellers are shutting them down. So go listen to this show. They'll explain this concept much more articulately than I just did. Um, but that's a really good introduction to this incredible market of massive opportunity that I think exists out there. And I think there's a really close relationship with that market of these small, you know, clean, carpet cleaning, laundromat, uh, electronic store, liquor store, HVAC company, construction equipment rental, these types of businesses that rent for these, that sell for these small multiples of cash flow, or even in some cases, small multiples of inventory on hand. Maybe, maybe an electronic store is selling for $600,000. And if you just sell out of the current inventory, you're going to make $400,000, right? So you got a lot of downside protection. This is a really fascinating industry. And I think the coronavirus could trigger a really interesting opportunity for people to go in there buy these businesses, make extraordinary returns. And, and the wonderful thing about this is this guy is preserving the legacy of these business owners who have poured 30 years of their lives into it, often who have hired, you know, folks who are, um, you know, on parole or who are single mothers and depend on that job and are preserving their jobs and their, their legacy as a business. It's just a fantastic episode and a fantastic opportunity to go explore uh, if you're interested in this sort of thing in conjunction with real estate. And then, of course, you can also go the entrepreneurial route and start your own business from scratch. Yes. And Alan Donegan is from Pop-Up Business School. We had him on our episode 17, and he was also a guest on the business podcast, episode number nine. And he talks, Pop-Up Business School talks about how to create, like, what is that book, The Lean Startup? This is like the ultra super, super lean startup. You don't need to go and buy a, a building and invest in all the brand new equipment in order to start a business. You can piggyback off of other businesses. You can start it from your own house. You can test at, you know, test out the waters. And Alan does a really great job of teaching you how to do that through a series of these free business schools that he runs uh, mainly in the UK, but he's starting to come over to America too. Um, but just starting your own business and learning how to do it right is so powerful. And it's, you know, it's really not that hard. You hear these these statistics and frankly, I don't even know what the actual statistic is. 90% of all small businesses fail within the first year and 95 of those fail in the second year or something. But when you look at it, it's because they're making bad choices, most of them. You know, making a few key choices can really be the difference between success and failure in your business. 
but yeah, episode 51 of the business podcast. Holy cow. You, you got to it before I did. That is just fire. Yeah. Love that episode. And you know, again, all this comes in the context of starting a business is probably going to be very difficult right now. Generating significant side hustle income is probably going to be more difficult now than it was six to eight weeks ago. You may be the exception. You may find a creative way around that. That's wonderful. But if you go into it understanding that that's a possibility and also understanding that right now your dollars are going farther in the stock market than they were six to eight weeks ago, offsetting that potentially lower wage or greater challenge to get started, right? That your dollars may go farther in buying a business or real estate in coming weeks or months. That certainly you're spending less most likely and that your dollars are going farther towards overall wealth accumulation in your, your total amount of savings. So understand it in that context and don't be discouraged if there is a little bit more difficulty in starting a business or generating that extra income in the short run here. That effort, will be, that effort is rewarded just as um, strongly over time, I think. But right now, starting a business can be very time intensive. Right now, you've got a, I don't want to say you've got a lot of time on your hands, but you kind of have a lot of time on your hands. You can do some of the time intensive work that maybe when real life happens again, when real life reopens, you might not have the opportunities to do. Use your time wisely is what we're trying to say. Love it. Okay, Scott, the last one is live the life you truly love because money is now not a consideration. You know, so this is, this is why we do it, right? Money is a tool to get, help us get to the lifestyle that we desire, right? And, you know, the trick here is I believe that most people in this country or even the world do not have a crystal clear understanding of what it is that they want. What life do you want? Where do you want to live? How do you want to live? What do you want to be in your house? What do you want your, how do you want your, your family to, to live? How do you want, what do you want to do for work? Right? What do you, if, even if you're retired, what do you want to do to be productive or pursue your hobbies? Right? If you don't know those things, you need to figure them out. And the way you do that, I think, is through goal setting. You set a goal. You set a five-year mission vision. You set annual goals. You set quarterly goals. You set weekly goals. And then you track your progress daily. And this is just I, what I would do in good times, bad. During my, during I do this for my career. I'll do it in retirement. I'll do it throughout my life. But work, it's, it's also not like overnight process. You can't just like sit down right now and map out your five-year vision for your life in crystal clear detail and work toward it uninterrupted. It will evolve. You may have no idea what you want. Start with something that generally sounds good and evolve that over time until you are feeling very good and you know exactly what you want. Because I guarantee you, you can't get towards any of these other goals. You're not going to put in the time and sacrifice to spend less than you earn increase your skill set, increase your income, invest super diligently and in a disciplined manner through the ups and downs of the markets over a very long period of time, or start businesses and be responsible for other people's lives if you don't know what you want. <laughs> so it all comes down to that. Understand that. Understand it's a work in progress and go set about and figure it out. Absolutely. 100% agree. It isn't, the goal for financial independence is not, I got to quit my job. And I think that a lot of people kind of lose sight of that. So the goal should be financial independence so that I can then live the life that I truly love. That can be volunteering. That can be starting a business that employs other people. And you don't really make that much money, but you don't care because it's your lifelong passion. Just set a goal. Scott, you have a very impressive goal sheet. I have seen you fill this out. Uh, what have we worked together now? Five years? I've seen you fill this out uh, pretty much daily for five years. And I would like to link to that in the show notes for today's show so people can see not only what it is that you're doing, but also start a, a, a goal-setting regimen for themselves. Because I, I mean, you... You're kind of a success story. I don't know if you know this, but youngest CEO in Bigger Pockets history. That's, you know, <laughs> it's, that's kind of a tongue in cheek joke because the only yeah. other CEO we ever had is not that much older than Scott. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, the point is, if look, I do not, I don't know if I'm like a goal setting guru. There's lots of really good resources out there. I actually started off with um, looking at some of the stuff by Darren Hardy. I think he's got a, some really good stuff. There's a, a book called The 12 Week Year, if you're interested in, in, in goal setting around that, um, which as a, uh, 
you can probably predict what that's about. Um, we've got a journal at Bigger Pockets, the the ninety day intention journal that you can buy um, that can help you set some goals. It's specifically geared towards real estate, but can be used towards lots of other things. And then personally, what works for me is I just write down what I want on a piece of paper. I write down my five year vision. I write down my quarterly goals. I write down, and then I have a daily log that I work towards those quarterly and annual goals every day. And I just fill it out. It's a printout. You can find it on Bigger Pockets. We'll link to the show notes if you want to see mine. It has my goals on it. Um, one of the goals is related to Virginia. There's nothing in Virginia that I care about. Virginia is the name of my fiance. So just <laughs> note that uh, when you're doing this. But <laughs> you know, that's that that's that's my my mechanism there. And it's, it's just whatever works for you. It's nothing. Fan- it's a Word document that I created. So you know, you, you can download them there. But I, I encourage you, however it is you want to go about it, write down what you want. And work toward it every day, even if it's for five, 10 minutes. Uh, but I think your, your document is very uh, helpful to people who haven't started one before. Yeah. And, and what's helpful also is I, I got like five, six years now of these printouts. It's a lot of trees, but that, that's what works for me. And they're all in my filing cabinet down here. And I can review back to them. You know, if one day when I'm you know, old, I can be like, oh, look, look, back in 2020 in April during the coronavirus, I was doing this, 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 and this. So it was a productive day or a lousy day, you know. Well, I think reviewing what worked and what didn't is very helpful for going forward. And I would say you're very successful. And part of your success is because you have your eye on your goals all the time. Yeah, I'm never distracted for more than a couple of hours or a couple a day or two at most from uh, my top overall goals. I think that's pretty powerful. Look at what it's gotten you. Well, thank you. I appreciate the compliment. Okay, Scott, uh, do you have a joke for us today? Oh, gosh. Um... Wow, you're not prepared? I'm not prepared. I didn't realize I was going to be on the spot for the Famous Four today. I'm going to go to my favorite Instagram profile right now. I'm going to go. Dad says jokes. Um, A woman named named Carla sent us some jokes too. I just heard that Kim Jong-un is sick. I guess that makes him Kim (laughs) Jong-il. That's, oh, I can't, no, because that's, okay, so I don't wish somebody to be sick, but I'm probably not the president of his fan club. Yeah, you know. (laughs) What else you got, Mindy? What do you call a man doing yard work? Mo. Ah, I like it. (laughs) Ooh, what do you call a man in the bushes? We'll have a lot of clippings of these jokes, by the way, for you oh, guys, God. if you're interested in listening later. <laughs> and the position of co-host is now bush- available. A man I in the bushes, quit. Russell. Yes. That's my brother's name, yeah. <laughs> Russell. Oh, I yeah. thought it was, I didn't know his name was Russell. Yeah, Rusty. Rus- Rus- Russell or Rusty Treadship. Yeah. Rusty, if you're thought- listening, we love you. You're awesome. Rusty, I am the president of your fan club, too. There you go. Okay, Scott, should we get out of here? This was kind of a pretty long episode, although I think it is really important to revisit the basics of financial independence. Clearly, I have been messing it up by doubling my spending every year. Um, And just getting back to the, you know, why am I doing this? Your goals, your, your, you know, the whole why of, what's your why of phi? My why of phi is to be secure. Yeah, love it. And, you know, it look, it's it's all the things we st- we talk about all all, all along, right? Spend less than you earn and track your income. Spend less than you earn and track your spending. Look for ways to increase your income over the long term. Invest in low cost quality index funds for the very long term and other appreciable assets like real estate or small businesses. And then create streams of income opportunistically, right? It's the same stuff, and we do it all in the context of that goal of developing a long term lifestyle that is exactly what we want an independent or not dependent on wage income, right? That is the key to this whole game. That's what we believe is a very worthwhile mission for your your personal finances and a very important goal for the vast majority of people in this country or any capitalist society. And um, we love it and we'll be there approach, attacking this forever. We will. Okay. From episode 122 of the Bigger Pockets Money podcast, he is Scott Trench and I am Mindy Jensen. And... Uh, we're going to go reset our finances. That was dumb too. I need to work on these. These are really starting to suck. Okay. If you have any suggestions, fine. send them to me because I clearly can't make them up by myself. 
By the way, if you're still listening, we would truly appreciate it if you could leave us a rating or review on iTunes and join us on the discussion on our Facebook page. Just type in Bigger Pockets Money into Facebook and request to join the group. You'll be asked a couple of questions and you'll need to have a joke handy like I did not today. But uh, we love that discussion. We've got about three, four thousand 4,000 members. We have a lot of lively little debates on there um, that are going fantastically. We've also got a new Bigger Pockets official Facebook group, which is for the real estate uh, component of that. So you can join both. Um, or none, but please do leave us a review. Thanks. Have a good day.